I'm really very encouraged by the turnout tonight. It's excellent. It's very nice to see uh, all of you here. Um, I'm not sure if this is a poor television evening or if the subs have run out or what, but uh, it's really good to see you all. So I'm Gary Purdy. I'm Councillor Gary Purdy. My ward is Flasson Ward, which covers Flasson, uh, Black of Bath, uh, Bonsall, Slaley, uh, that sort of area. Uh, I've been leader since the election in May last year. Uh, and so I'll just do that brief introduction and then I'm going to hand over to my deputy uh, and then I'll ask the officers of the council just to stand up and introduce who they are. Thank you very much. Um, hi there, I'm Sue Robertson. I'm deputy leader of the council. Uh, I'm ward manager for Chatsworth, including Beeley uh, and Enza and Pilsley. Uh, it's great to see so many of you here tonight. Uh, we have had a little criticism that we've only got one forum uh, on this round. We are looking for further ways, but we do need dedicated broadband, not just Wi-Fi. So if you do have any suggestions as to where we can hold future forums, you know, please let us know. So before I move on to introduce the officers, or the officers themselves, uh, I need to cover some domestic issues, please. So fire drill. There's no fire drill expected. The fire alarm goes off. In exits are there and through the door you came in and uh, assembled out on the car park. Toilets are outside, you probably saw them coming in. Uh, you'll see Jim over there with cameras while well, we are being filmed live. Um, there's hundreds of people watchers and watching us on YouTube tonight. <laughs> so if, if you're not wanting to be on film, uh, my suggestion is you need to sit at the back. Especially for those of you that want to ask questions, if you're very sensitive and don't want to be filmed, uh, it's your data protection right, and we don't insist that you, you stand up and have your mugshot shown, shown on YouTube. But if you want, you can watch it all on YouTube tomorrow. Uh, it'll be good for sleeping venture for you. All with it. So, I think I've got all the domestic issues out of the way. Um, being filmed, if you get to the question point at the end, if uh, or after the officers given their their uh, briefing. If you just say who you are, please, and who you represent, that would be very helpful. We do have a note taker, so we'll keep a record of what transpires tonight. So I'd like to ask our Chief Executive, Paul Wilson, just to introduce himself, and then each officer in turn, so that you can identify who the officers of the council are. Paul. Yes, thank you, Councillor Purdy. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paul Wilson, Chief Executive of the District Council, and the rest of my corporate leadership team is here this evening to assist with these proceedings. So, pass on first to Ash. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm Ashley Watts. I'm the Head of Community and Environmental Services for the District Council, and I'll be doing the first presentation on the Waste and Recycling Service. Uh, evening everyone, I'm Steve Capes, I'm Head of Regeneration and Policy in the District Council and I'll be doing the presentation on the Corporate Plan. Hello everybody, I'm Karen Henriksen, the Council's Head of Resources and I'll be doing the presentation on the Council's proposed budget. Thank you. Hello, I'm Tim Braun, I'm the Head of Regulatory Services at the District Council. And I'm Sandra Lamb, Head of Corporate Services, here to answer any questions at the end. Um, good evening, I'm Robert Coggins, I'm the Head of Housing for the District Council. And I'd like to introduce uh, a guest who's come all the way from the Peak Park District, so John. Yeah. Yeah. Um, evening, uh, evening everybody, um, I think I know quite a few of you anyway. Um, I'm John Scott, I'm the Director for Conservation and Planning at the National Park Authority. And they'll live in Bakewell too. Thank you. Thank you, John. A uh, question was asked earlier tonight if Dorbis County Council officers are present. They, uh, I'm led to understand, they've been invited. Uh, I've not actually seen any officer from that authority, but they have been invited. So we'll move on to the agenda proper, please, um, and introduce us. Watts, who's going to talk about the waste contract and chargeable garden, uh, garden waste uh, together with Steve Cates. So, gentlemen, over to you. Thank you. Uh, good evening again. Um, just to, to recap, really, uh, as you're probably already aware, the, the Council has been going through the procurement of a new waste collection service and we have recently awarded that contract to Serco, who are the incumbent. Um, contractor. Um, I guess 
going back to the beginning, the, the challenge that we had was to, um, as we put up on the slide there, is to procure a waste and recycling contract that is affordable whilst meeting the needs of residents. We, we knew through public consultation at the beginning of this process that actually the service that's provided at the moment is valued by residents. Um, there are areas for improvement, we accept that being the main the service that is delivered is a good service uh, and in terms of our performance in, with recycling rates it's, it's certainly um, one of the best in the region and it's, it's currently ranked ninth best in the country so we knew that we were doing a good job and we didn't want to, to lose any of that, in fact we wanted to build on it. So. Um, with that in mind, we have gone through a particular process, a, a set procurement process that local government follows. Um, but helping shape what that contract looked like, we went through public consultation, we went through consultation with elected members, we did a series of workshops and briefings to try and narrow down what was important to us within that specification. We then went into what we refer to as soft market testing. So we invited, um, all the main players in the market to come and talk to us about what they were looking for in terms of a contract and although it's a big value contract to an authority of our size actually in terms of an overall value and what else is out there in the market is it's relatively small so we needed to make sure that we were going to get interest from the market so we needed to understand what would be appealing to contractors but also what were the red lines um, in the sand in terms of what they wouldn't accept um, so on the, on the slide there you will see that there were three things in particular that we were keen um, to try and identify as part of that soft market testing. Um, and, and I'll pick the second point out first and that was risk share because we knew through talking to, to our consultants, you know me, that the current contract that we're in at the moment with Serco, 100% of the liabilities sit with Serco. So, any fluctuations in recycling value and, and the material costs, uh, as we we're all experiencing now with plastics, they carry the can with that. It's, it's entirely up to them to cover their costs. Any other fluctuations in wage rises, fuel rises, and so on, it would be at the cost of Serco. We know that the market has shifted uh, in the last eight years so much so that some of the contractors that we were meeting were unwilling to take any level of, of liability. So it's gone from 100% um, of liability sitting with the contractor to on average 20 to 30%. That's all they were willing to accept. So that made it quite a challenge for, for officers in trying to put together a complement and specification that would be appealing in that market. And then the other two points are almost interlinked, which is the purchase of vehicles and the nature of the district. Because thinking back when the last waste contract was implemented, we suffered significant disruption um, to, to service there. And, and in part, that was down to not having appropriate vehicles for the nature of this district. There's no point in just purchasing 10 to 15 huge vehicles because they're not going to get around the roads in, in the dark, you know. So we needed to make sure that any contractor that was likely to bid on this contract had taken in the uniqueness of the Dale uh, and the topography of the district. Um, then the th through the procurement process, we invite bidders to, to submit initial tenders. We then go into a, what we refer to as a technical stage, so the, the detail of the specification, making sure that they uh, were meeting that. Then there's, a, there's a, almost a pause in there where they submit. It gives officers um, or the project team a um, chance to evaluate what that submission looks like. We then go into a period of negotiation, basically asking them to sharpen their pencil in terms of the finance and also pick out some aspects that we think that they could do better on. Uh, and then they go back and then they do a resubmission and then we get to a point of awarding the contract, which is what we did on the 18th of, of December last year. So I've touched on the, um, some of the costs. Um, and in the current contract, we know that Serco pitched that contract um, significantly under the going rate at that time. Now, that contract was important to them, so they uh, applied for it, bid for it, uh, at a cost. Those costs have obviously escalated, as we talked with the, the situation with plastics, staffing increase, fuel costs, and so on and so forth. So we know that that was running about a three to four hundred pound loss, uh, three hundred to four hundred thousand pound loss a year. Um, so we knew that we were not going to get 
um, the same value of contract, but actually what has happened is where we were entering a market that was particularly buoyant eight years ago, ten years ago, we're in a market that's quite the opposite at the moment. It is a bidder's market. Costs have escalated, general contract costs have escalated as well as the impact on um, commodity values. So there was always going to be an increased cost in there and we had to accept that. In terms of looking at that cost, we had to weigh up what we thought the service could lose, um, essentially, to, to try and bring the cost down. But following the public consultation, it was clear that we didn't want to lose any of that. We didn't want, nobody wanted to move to four weekly collections. There was some resistance to three weekly collections, but it, in the main residents were keen to retain recycling levels, still want to go and collection services. Sorry about that. Interesting window. Um, but um, we, we knew that there were, there were pressures, um, but we were keen to, to, to achieve as much as we could uh, through that contract. Um, so <laughs> that there were a huge number of factors, uh, and we seem almost to be entering the world market at the very worst time in terms of cost. So we had accepted as a group that we knew that the value of the contract would be in excess of what we were hoping for, um, and that um, certainly has been the case. Excuse me, I'm trying to finish up. Um, <clears throat> down there, you'll see that this, this slide illustrates actually the, the, the cost pressures of, that count, of the contract. So the, it's jumping ahead to, to where we're at now, and I'd like to just go back a little bit just to, to explain the process further. But the outcome of the procurement exercise, so that's the management fee, the cost of the vehicles, the leasing of the depot, everything that's associated to procuring a waste contract, it, that's that value there. So that's, that's £3.2 million. Pounds. The budgetary provision that we put aside um, was £2.4 million. Pounds which leaves us, as you can see, with a significant shortfall. So we've got about £750,000 um, a year to find, um, which is why we put forward, as part of the recommendations, that we do retain garden waste, but it would have to be as a chargeable service. And we accept that that's not popular with everybody, but given the overall value of the contract and to be able to sustain what residents were asking for, it was the only way for us to be able to go some way to affording that level of service. So, what members did approve um, was that um, weekly food waste would, would continue as it does now. The alternate weekly collections would retain, even though we had considered four weekly and three weekly. There was a very strong view, especially regarding four weekly collections, that that didn't go ahead. So we have retained alternate weekly. <coughs> Uh, and also alternate weekly recycling collections. The only change that we have is the uh, addition of the chargeable garden waste service. We have um, to give us some flexibility um, and also depending on the cost pressures as we go forward on the authority, we do have an opportunity at the midway point in the contract to revisit the possibility of three weekly collections. And we put that in there simply because of um, future financial pressures that we may suffer. But I must stress that that would not just be implemented. It would need to go back to council for a decision. It would be an elected member decision. And it would only be if recycling rates had been, uh, been hampered or were suffering and the financial uh, benefits of that matched up to the, the needs of the council. Um, but that is in there. So, in addition to that, what we have got um, is, oh, despite frustrations really with the increased cost of the contract, we have got a very good contract. Um, from the resident's point of view, nothing really changes. Um, it's the same contract, the same collections, um, still got the same number of containers. But in addition to that, what we do have is what we refer to as in-cab technology. And the income technology allows us to have real-time response from the crews to uh, officers back at the town hall. So if a resident calls to say, my bin has been missed, we're able to do a live response to the crew who, if they are in the area and have not been there, the person you're speaking to on the phone will be able to say, actually, we've not got to your road yet, you've not been missed, we'll be there in the next 20 minutes or so. 
Um, it also allows us to identify where people have presented contaminated bins uh, or contaminated waste or they haven't put the bins out, that is noted on the system. So if that resident calls, we're able to give more detailed feedback. Uh, so it's a much more responsive customer service than, than we had previously. We've also got um, 360 degree cameras on, on all of the refuse collection vehicles. And again, that supports when residents uh, call to say, my bin's been damaged, my bin's not been returned to the, the right place, or my waste wasn't collected. We can check that on the CCTV, and therefore we can take appropriate action uh, from there. Also, if one of the refuse collection vehicles damages another vehicle, uh, we've got the video footage there that can be provided to, to deal with the um, insurance claim following. <coughs> We will have the introduction of online services, including uh, the option to pay online for green waste collections, which will be a much more straightforward and simple, clean process than, than we have now for, for online payment. So we've got a back office team who are working hard on getting that in place um, for, for June, ready for June for soft testing, um, ready for the introduction of the new contract in August. A few other key points um, picking out from the report, and that is that the council is to finance the vehicles. And we've had a few questions about that, which is why we put the point on the slide. Um, the, the reason that the council has financed the purchase of the vehicles is because, quite frankly, we have better borrowing rates than a private contractor is able to access. And if the contractor did purchase the vehicles, they would add a management fee onto that process, so it actually saves the council money by purchasing the vehicles in the first place. Um, as well as the, um, uh, whilst we're talking about the vehicles, the council has um, a strong uh, climate agenda and a focus on trying to improve the um, environmental impacts of our contracts, and with this, what we have got, we've got biofuel use, and the ancillary vehicles and the smaller vehicles that we've got um, will be hybrid uh, vehicles also. And the, the refuse collection vehicles themselves will have electric bin lifts, which is quite an improvement on the current contract. There's also a commitment on the, the local on the contractors to use local uh, businesses where they can, and they've given a percentage of their spend. Uh, as a commitment for uh, spending within local business, whether it's hauliers, whether it's fuel, whether it's just equipment or uniform and so on, they have to use local businesses. And there's also a commitment to supporting uh, local employment by working with schools and colleges through apprenticeships as well as employing local people. The garden waste service, I uh, need to be clear, this is an opt-in service. So. Um, <coughs> Only if you want the service would you take part in it. That the service will continue as it is at the moment uh, and it will be free up until uh, April 2021 when the chargeable service will start. It will continue to be an alternate weekly collection or fortnightly collection and it's a standard £50 fee a year for a 12-month service. We are offering a £35 one-off early bird into reductionary offer from September this year. So anybody that takes out um, the garden waste subscription between September and January will get it for £35 in the, third, in the first year. Following that, it'll be £50 per year for, for your collection. We are trying to place some added value on that and it will include things like the collection of your Christmas tree um, each year, but also Although it's not fully defined how we, we we're going to do this because we we're still working on the detail, but we would like to have almost like a gardening club that comes with it. So um, maybe discounts with local garden centres, information on home composting and, and other information relating to what you can do with your garden waste and what you can get back for subscribing to that service. We appreciate it's quite a change uh, in terms of the, the garden waste service and also um, with the, the contract changing over, there's no direct impact on, on the resident in that sense, but we will be doing, as we have done through this process, is regularly communicating with our partners and with residents through um, the different media uh, streams and outlets that we have. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Ash. Um, I think with the ringtone over there, could go into our lorry cabs, that would keep them going, wouldn't it? 
Brilliant. I, I'm glad it was yours, sir, not mine, because it'd be more embarrassing if mine went off. Um, so, questions to Ash, uh, please, which you'd just like to name who you are, sir, yep. and if you represent an organisation, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, Richard Ward, Living Baker. Um, these 360 degree cameras, uh, uh, is there a view available to the driver from these cameras while he's driving? Is it just something for supervising? Uh, That's a good question. Um, I'm not. I can't say with confidence that there is, but I believe there is. I mean, from, from our point of view, it is about being able to, to use the, the, that system to follow up um, issues raised with residents. But I, I believe that there is an in-cab system, not necessarily for the, for the driver, but the other the crew that's in the car. I'm just thinking as a cyclist, because uh, visibility, you know, it's not always uh, good in every vehicle. I will find that out, a good down, question. Okay. Thank you. Good point. Uh, next, please, question. <coughs> Carol. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> well, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you on what you do for my family with collecting clinical waste. But why does it need such a large vehicle to do it? And, you know, to me, are they going around many hospitals or is it mainly old people who are having nurses in. Um, I would like to congratulate you. It is very important thing. Um, and, and quite frankly, I think that it doesn't upset me about the garden waste. But the other question I would like to ask is, it would be nice to know what we can actually put in our recycling bins, plastic-wise. People are very confused where they can put yogurt pots in, or food trays, whatever. So I think that that perhaps could be addressed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. Walker, I, I, absolutely. I, and, and this is part of the reason we, we mentioned about reviewing the fleet vehicles, mm. because um, we, we think there's a better way of doing it than has been done previously. And the new contract <coughs> offers more uh, have a, a greater number of smaller vehicles uh, and also in terms of um, clinical waste and assisted collections it's going to be a more discreet service um, as in, in some situations I could be quite sensitive to residents so that forms part of this new contract going forward so there will be smaller vehicles um, I think your point on what goes in which bin uh, is a really good point and it's one that often comes back to us what I would say is, on the District Council's website, there is a really good YouTube video of one of our recycling advisors, or former recycling advisors, sadly, um, that we um, moved on uh, last year uh, to, to another employer. She did a, vi um, a video on there that outlines what can go in which container, and I think that's really, really good. In terms of the information that's out there, I think it's a good opportunity to refresh that. Under the new contract, we will have um, an education officer as well. So we have a replacement who is due to start in the next couple of weeks for the recycling advisor who's in the video, but also we'll have an education officer that will work with schools and community groups to not just help understand what can go in which, but how people can recycle more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Lady at the back. Thank you. Lady at the back. I was delighted to hear about your concern for climate um, issues. Related to that, in the road that I live along, there are 13 households. Five of them do not drive, but they all have gardens. If they need to get their, as many of us will, get their stuff down to Darleydale, they can't do it. And if they, even if they could do it, like the rest of us, instead of one bin lorry, there'd be 13 cars going back and forth. So is that a very environmentally sensitive way of going about things? Though I do appreciate very much your, your dilemma, and I, I sympathize with you, but I think environmentally it's, it's a bit regressive. Um, <clears throat> and, and it's, it's difficult, isn't it, to, because it's, given the nature of the district, there are quite a number of new, unique um, situations or the, the, there's not one size fits all for this district so we have looked at um, like I say smaller 
uh, vehicles. There's also the option uh, for properties to do home composting and we'll be providing information on that. Uh, and, and there are the household recycling uh, options. Some residents have already indicated that although they don't have a large garden and probably wouldn't use a full bin, what they will do is share with a neighbour uh, and that's an option. So it would be one payment for, for the bin because that's what we'll be looking at is a collection for that bin. It is possible for, for neighbours to share it if they come to that agreement. Another lady at the back, thank you. Hi, Colleen from Matlock. I've just got a couple of questions about the 360 cameras and how they operate. Um, what range of capture would they have? Where's the data kept? And do they have any GDPR implications in terms of what's actually captured and kept? Okay. Um, in terms of the first question, quite honestly, I'm not quite sure what the range of capture is, um, but it is within the vicinity of the vehicle. That's what it's focused on. Um, it is to do with, as, as was rightly mentioned earlier, about cyclists, it's about other vehicles in there, but also with uh, the rear of the vehicle with the, the tail lift and, and the, the use of bins. GDPR is um, quite obviously for, for a local government, we have to cover that, and it was a feature within the contract and part of that specification, so it's, <coughs> it has to be fully compliant. Thank you. If I just may add to that, to the lady at the back, uh, in council we do get reports on the Data Protection Act and the RIPA, the Regulation of Investigative Powers, and we are scrutinised quite closely on that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Henry Focard from Greenblow. A comment, really, and a request, because I know everybody's in a terrible position with public finances. My concern is that we do live in a national park. Uh, and it's important from the point of view of tourism and all that sort of thing because it looks clean and tidy. Now, my fear, and it's not reality yet, but my fear is that people, if they have to pay £50 to have their garden waste removed, will be inclined to dip it at the roadside or somewhere else. And I think that's a real problem you need to be aware of. It's not actually fair to landowners to have to pay to remove somebody else's waste because it's been done. It's not fair to the National Park Authority to have to pick up the pieces because they've got cash flow problems too. So there's not an easy answer to it and it hasn't happened yet. It does affect in some places, it does affect informal access to open countryside too because landowners block off informal land laybys to stop people parking there to dump. So it brings a raft of issues. There's not an easy answer for you, but can I just ask you to keep an eye on it and monitor it? And if it raises itself as a problem, as I hope it won't, but it may do, perhaps you'll be able to react to that. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. If I can just say that in the number of workshops that the officers put on for the members, that was a regular question we members asked. Uh, but I'll let Ash answer because the evidence really isn't out there on fly tipping. But yes, sir, it's something we would definitely watch. Thank you. Yeah, just to follow on from that, and um, we, we've had this discussion with our, our consultants, and although fly tipping does increase in more urban areas, there is no evidence to suggest that that increases uh, in areas such as the Dales. But I understand why residents may have some scepticism over for those comments. Um, what it would say is we already monitor and respond quite quickly to, to fly tipping and we will monitor um, to see if there is an increase and also the nature and the type of the fly tipping that occurs and we will have to review that should, should it increase. Thank you. The gentleman on the side there. Well, John Bucklehurst, very well. Uh, very simple question. Have the council considered incineration as opposed to landfill for waste? Um, yes, we, we considered a, a, a number of options and I said we have looked at also what the disposal sites are and what the facilities are within the locality to us and in thinking about the, the impact on the environment, what we don't want is refuse collection vehicles having to trail further miles than, than is necessary because the impact on the environment on that is, is, is great. Um, so we, what we think we've got is um, 
a good and for, for the current situation within Derbyshire and, and within close proximity to Derbyshire Dales is a, is a good option in terms of disposing of our waste. We've got a really good um, dry recycling facility. The standard of recycled waste that residents collect here is, is what we refer to as pure, so it's pretty much as good as you could get when it goes to those um, um, disposal sites. And the organic waste is going down to Vital Earth uh, in, in Ashbourne. And with the work that we're doing in terms of education and with our recycling advisors and the contractor, there is a commitment to reducing the amount of waste that goes to landfill. So it's, there are other options other than just incineration. Uh, I'm no expert in this, but there are question marks in terms of um, the environmental, environmental impact of incineration of waste as well. Uh, you're right, Ash, on that point. I was speaking to an officer the other day. When I was a county councillor 2009-13, we tried to get an incineration plant down at Simpkin in Derby. That was erected, but it had te technical difficulties. I've heard that they're hopeful of resolving that, but yes, the residents of that area were very concerned about the output. Next question, please. Uh, Nick Dibbin from Matlock. How will you know which green bins are being paid for? Yeah. I'm glad you brought this up. Um, okay. Um, yes, uh, with the InCab technology, everybody who subscribes to garden waste collections or they require an assisted collection or have clinical waste collections, that will be logged on the system. So as the crew is driving down the road, they know that number 10 subscribes to the garden waste service. In addition to that, there will be a sticker that is placed on that bin so they know which bin to collect and they will be able to cross-reference the in-cap tech to the sticker that's placed on the bin. Thank you, Ash. I'd just like to take one more question and then move on to our next presentation, please. And in actual fact, I need to say that we need to be able to be by nine o'clock. So, one more question for Ash. All happy? What gentleman at the back? It's all well and good saying that we haven't paid for green waste collection and everything, but our friends down here seem to get theirs collected for free when they dump it in car parks and side of road. <laughs> Point noted, thank you sir. <laughs> the next presentation is our Derbyshire Dales corporate plan, uh, and I'd like to call upon Steve Capes please. Just to, uh, to remind you, I'm, I'm Steve Capes, I'm Head of Regeneration and Policy, and it's the, it's the corporate plan that I'll be talking to you for a, a short while about tonight. Um, just in terms of an outline, I'll be saying a little bit about what it is and, and what it does, and our, our challenges as a council as we're putting it together, uh, and then say a little bit about our proposals for the, uh, for, the, for, the, for the next four years. We've done a lot of consultation, so it's only right that we, we feed that back to you and also run past our proposals uh, with you. Um, so I'll give a, give a shot at um, doing the jargon bit to start with. Um, what is the corporate plan? Um, well, it's, um, if you like, it's our top level plan as a council. It's our plan of all plans. It's, the, it's the, the, the highest level plan under which all our other plans and strategies sit. So if you like, it's got um, high level priorities rather than, rather than all the details. We have plenty of other plans never fear, which have all the details in them, um, but this is like our, our overall strategy. It is determined by council, is it's where their priorities are, are set out for, for the four year term, um, and the difficulty that, that they have is balancing all the aspirations that, that councillors and residents have with the resources that are available to the council. We are one of the smaller councils, we don't have the level of, of resources that, that, that some do, 
nor the level of resources that we had 10 years ago. So that is a, a, a balancing act for us. Um, moving on, so the, the, the particular challenge that we do have is that when setting priorities is that everything is a priority to someone. There's, there's nothing that isn't important. Um, the difficulty is if we put everything in, then nothing becomes a priority. So we members do have to make some, some difficult decisions here. Um, resources are tight, Karen's going to say more about those in a moment, and so that sometimes means we have to make difficult decisions, and that, um, I, I have immense respect for our councillors because that's their job to make those difficult decisions. Um, a little bit about the consultation that we've done then. We, we um, spent the first half of last year doing quite a lot of consultation. Um, we did a big postal and email and, and internet survey. Um, we had something like 1,345 people responding. That's, 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 that's for a district with only, only 70,000 residents. That's a very good response. And it's actually a better response than we got when we did the same survey um, five years ago. Um, one of the um, figures that we asked about was resident satisfaction with the, with the district council. Um, something that we do track over time and 71% of residents said they were satisfied with the district council uh, which was pleasing, not high enough but higher than it had been in 2015 when only 65% of people were satisfied with the district council so it's heading in the right direction. We, um, well, the, 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 the survey included a lot of things but in, in um, summary, this slide summarises um, in headline terms, what residents told us. Uh, and that is, for, for people living in the Derbyshire Dales, their biggest problem or the biggest priority that they think we'll can, we can deal with as a council is jobs and homes. Um, the point being that um, there's plenty of jobs in the Derbyshire Dales, but they don't pay very well. There's plenty of houses, but they are too expensive, so we need more affordable housing in the Derbyshire Dales. And people give us a clue as to what they mean by affordable homes. One, two, and maybe three bedroom homes, rather than the bigger ones. Um, we also ask people about, um, as you might expect in a beautiful, clean, green area like the Derbyshire Dales, how clean and green they think it is. They do recognise what a beautiful and clean and safe district they live in. Um, and they want us to keep it that way, obviously. There are, however, some hotspots. Um, there are some hotspots, particularly for dog mess and litter, um, and the issue that, that people had was reporting it and get it cleared up quickly. So it's overall a really good picture, but the issue that people raised was reporting and getting things cleared up quickly where there are problems, which is fair enough. Uh, there were a lot of comments, um, again, as you might expect, given the recent uh, developments, about car parking and, and toilets. What, what no one could help us with though would be where the money comes from if any of those mm -hmm. positions were to change. We, we also looked at the, uh, at the, if you like, the facts and figures, the, uh, the, the stats, the evidence that's collected by the, by, the, by, the, um, by the Office for National Statistics and so on, and that tells us some, some, some key points. It, it's, it, um, evidence is that the Derbyshire Dales is a low wage economy, one of the lowest of all the districts in the country. We have some brilliant businesses in the Derbyshire Dales that do want to grow. Uh, the problem they have is not space for them to grow into. Um, not just in the National Park, but also in the rest of the district, there's space available for businesses to expand and therefore take on more, better employees is short. So that's something we need to do something about. Housing affordability is also clearly a, a, a valid point, um, particularly for younger people, and, and we have um, an ageing population as well. Younger people move out, they go to university, they leave school here with excellent qualifications because we've got great schools, they go away, can't afford to move back. So that's a problem. And, and as I mentioned, people do recognise that the district is very clean and safe, but there are some hotspots. So on top of all that, um, we have to look at our, our financial situation, and I'm not going to go through these because Karen's going to describe that more in a bit, but we do have a lot of fun financial uncertainty at the moment. The position um, may be clear for the next 12 months, but after that it, it's, it's very, very uncertain. But the District Council, as any local authority, does have to set a balanced budget. It's our duty under law to set a balanced budget. Our spending can't exceed our income, so all the things that... that our councillors, our officers, our residents would like us to do, 
We simply can't do them all. And that's why we have this corporate plan to try and set some priorities. So along that theme then, we're, we're, we've come up with, after a series of, of workshops and consultation events with the public, with councillors, with businesses and, and with our own staff, with three overall themes at the moment. Um, and they are people, place and prosperity, as a, as a shorthand way of looking at it. And under, and under people, we're referring particularly to a priority there of referring to customer service. Customer service being something that's something that the District Council can do better. Our services are pretty good, but how we provide the customer service can sometimes be improved. And customer experience is a word that I've heard used as well, and I think that's a very good way of, of describing it. Uh, and one thing we're looking at there is better digital services so that people who want to can access services 24-7 online. We still have our other methods of accessing the council as well, but for some people that convenience does work. Um, place being the second priority, and that's keeping the Dodgedales clean, green and, and safe. And uh, a new theme for the District Council under place, under clean and green if you like, is the climate change agenda. That is, we admit, pretty new for us. It's a new area of work for us, as most other local authorities at the moment, and, and we are finding our way. We have a climate change working group chaired by councillors. Councillor O'Brien here is, is on it, and it's supported by Tim, one of our um, CLT officers, and they're working very hard to come up with, a, with an action plan at, at the moment. But that's a fairly new area for us. And the final one is prosperity, and that's about those homes and jobs, more housing that's less unaffordable, and jobs which pay better wages. And so under each of those, we've identified some priorities and some, and some key actions. Um, and again, at the corporate plan, it's a fairly high level. We have very detailed plans that have, have a lot more detail in it. The um, completely illegible corporate plan that we have at the moment, um, which I do apologise, but this is the cut down version, I'll, I will tell you. Um, it has those three themes, people, place and prosperity, and underneath it a whole series of, 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 of priorities and, and, and actions. It is work in progress at the moment. The, the themes I've outlined, but the detail underneath it is something that councillors are, are working towards, and they're, they're getting closer now to be able to, um, to present a corporate plan at the council meeting. Our target is the 5th of March, because that's when it has to be, uh, has to be set. So that is all from me for now. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, the gentleman at the back, sir. This isn't actually from me. This is from Martin Nuttall. He can't get here tonight. He runs the Farmer's Feast. He wants to know, with the toilets here, his own toilet has been making over £12 a day, charging people that aren't customers to use his toilet, which is more than what they were asking for an attendant to run these ones here. Can I stop you there, sir? We'll deal with that at the end, because we've got open questions. This is in particular reference to the... About car the toilet. No, this is about the corporate plan. I want to have questions asked on the corporate plan. We'll come back to you at the question session at the end, please. So anybody on the corporate plan? Questions to Steve. Yeah. See our friend, sir. Good evening. How are you? Good evening to you. Nice yes. to see you. Um, some people know me as Freddie Burgess. I'm 96, normally veteran, and very interested indeed in the housing situation in Matlock. And what I want to ask about that corporate plan, not a word has been said about flooding, and I would have thought that was top of the corporate plan that you've got to deal with. The other one is urbanisation, which is going on at a terrible rate, in, as far as I'm concerned, on Matlock Bank. And again, nothing has been said there except of keeping it safe and green. And what you're doing is building houses everywhere so that it's not safe nor green. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harris. But as was mentioned earlier, we do have a climate change working agenda. We have dedicated ourselves to reduce our carbon footprint. You know full well that the application on Baker Road was assessed by the Environment Agency with no objection and the urbanisation is a direct instruction from government that the houses have to be built. So it's not us doing that. No, I'm sorry, I'm going to move on to not getting into debate. No, Johnson, not getting into debate, sir. Boris Johnson said that we need to keep our green fields. 
Uh, yeah, I'm not getting into the debate. No, I know, I know. It's question time, thank you. Any questions to Steve on the corporate plan? Gentleman at the back and then the lady at the back. Hello, it's James Johnson, uh, resident of Matlock. I was interested to hear what Steve was saying about the fact that there are plenty of homes in the uh, district. Um, but I was reading in the local plan that there's the objectively assessed housing need says that we need 5,680 dwellings, but there's already provision for 6,684, which leads me to think we've got an oversupply of over a thousand houses. Now, I also understand that the housing need consultation data table further reduces that uh, objectively assessed housing need. So my question is, why is the council considering building on greenfield sites, such as the Matlock Walls, when I don't think there's any need for these? The location is not sustainable. Freddie's just mentioned flooding that goes on up there. And <coughs> the council has declared a climate emergency. So why would you build on greenfield sites? Thank you. Just add a little bit quick one there before Councillor Purdy does come in. Um, we, we in the Derbyshire Dales at the moment have a, a 5.75 year um, supply of housing land. The government says we have to have at least a five year supply of housing land. If we go under that, then it's, well, in effect, it's a free for all for developers. They can build absolutely anywhere, subject to the planning situation. So, um, we are doing our utmost to fulfil that according to the national planning policy guidance. And as Councillor Purdy said, that is those requirements are set by by central government, not us. If I take you back to the first local plan, so when the government's criteria formula recommended six thousand houses for Derbyshire Dales, our officers presented to council that we haven't got infrastructure and that we should approve four thousand. So our local plan was thrown out by a government inspector and he added another 600 houses. So we are having to conform to government instructions. Lady at the back. Yeah, hi, Colleen again. Um, it's interesting to see that the results of the um, survey, as residents say that they want one, two and three bedroom houses, yet a heck of a lot of the large developments that have been going ahead and are slated to go ahead, I'm looking at the minute at treetops, which has already gone ahead so it's too late, three, four and five bedroom houses. So the question is, are all future planning applications that are going to be coming in, or are currently in, going to be assessed against what residents actually need and want, as opposed to what developers want to do for a quick profit? Uh, the answer is, is yes. Well, there is a policy in our local plan which, which says what the housing mix on site should be. But every site has to be treated on its individual merits, depending on the, on the viability constraints, which are, again, are independently assessed. So we are constrained, but there is a policy which tries to do exactly what you said. Any other questions, please, on the corporate plan? Still at the back, please. Again, it comes back to the four and five bedroom homes. Um, the Wald site, historically, over the last 30 years, planning applications were always turned down due to flooding, traffic, and access. I've got a copy of a letter from Derbyshire Dales turning down a one bedroom, sorry, a one dwelling house on the site of two garages that it would affect the neighbourhood um, and yet you're clearly going to get 430 houses go ahead. The site that we live on, it's a small residential road, we face nine years of construction, traffic, noise, dirt and then we'll have a relief road right up to Cavendish Road. Why is it sustainable? Councillor Purdy, you never did answer my question. I sent you a copy of the letter, responded, dear sir, just to acknowledge receipt of the letter, clearly not a sir, thank you very much. But I'm still waiting for an answer. What's changed on this site? 30 houses have always been turned down. 430, the maths don't I'm sorry. One apologise if I've not answered your specific question. I'm in some difficulty as a member of the planning committee so that I can't get involved in any planning application. Planning, planning committee, don't respond to that. Well, well, if you'd like to send it again, please, and I'll make sure I get an answer. 
Uh, so I'm a member of the planning committee, so we are duty bound to keep an open mind. Uh, there's no decision yet on the World Rise application. It's still being studied at great length by our officers with all the constituent uh, authorities uh, taking advice. So we need to wait for that recommendation to come out on that development. There's a lady at the back, I think. Hello, um, I'm Sheila Evans from uh, Derbyshire Climate Coalition. I'd like to, you mentioned you have a draft action plan with regard to uh, the climate. Um, this is going to be published in, I suppose, just over a month's time. So could you enlighten us as to what are the key areas that you're focusing on? We seem to be straying away from corporate plan, but I'll answer you quickly. Yes, we've got a climate change working group on it. We're working in collaboration with other authorities like the Bee Park and Derbyshire County Council. We're going to hook onto strategy documents. I've had a very productive meeting with Dr. Peter Dewes this morning at Derby University, so that we're looking for universities to help us on this. Uh, and then there is a need in all authorities to identify an officer resource to drive this agenda forward. Any questions on the corporate plan for Steve? Steve seems to be getting off light at the moment. Yeah, I, can, I can add a little bit on the, on, the, on the climate change action plan. As I say, it is work in progress at the moment, and we do have, have a group of, who are busy working it up. At the moment, we have, if you like, an interim action plan, um, and that's focusing on, on four areas. One is the council's buildings, uh, our estates, if you like. Um, the other is, is housing. The the third is planning, and the fourth is the council's vehicles, our, our vehicle fleet. So our initial four areas are looking at are those, but that is just an interim plan. There's work going on to come up with a, a more detailed climate change plan, as Councillor Purdy says, hopefully in conjunction with other authorities in Derbyshire, because we don't feel it's something we can do entirely on our own. Thank you, Steve. Lady at the back. Hello, uh, my name is Wendy Buller, I'm a member of the Derbyshire Climate Coalition. I'd just like to ask the gentleman at the front, um, in relation to housing, uh, being part of the Climate Change Action Plan, um, we did a recent survey of residents, which was conducted by the Derbyshire Climate Coalition, and nearly half of our respondents said that the reduction in carbon emissions from housing was their top priority. And considering that Derbyshire Dales District Council declared a climate emergency in May 2019, has the authority used its statutory powers to change planning policy to require developers of all the many thousands of houses that are due to be built to build with carbon neutral homes or carbon reduced homes? And, th and that is something we're very conscious of and very much working on. The, the Climate Change Working Group, which, uh, which I mentioned, one of their proposals is to, um, for us to implement a supplementary planning document uh, on exactly that, on, on climate change. That's something which we think will feature in the corporate plan, um, and, but it's something that, um, as this year moves on, is something that we will develop and then consult on and hopefully get adopted. Uh, and when it is, that will be a material consideration for planning applications. Um, with planning, every material consideration does have to be weighed up, but uh, we'd like to have a supplementary planning document that sets out clearly what we feel are the material considerations with regard to climate change. So, so yes, that is something we're very much working on. Thank you, Steve. I'll take one last question from the lady on the corporate plan, and then we'll move on to the budget presentation. Um, have you got adequate staffing levels to deliver this corporate plan? Because at the, mo at the moment, as a consumer, some of the uh, delivery is uh, less than I would desire currently. Any specific area you're talking about, Madam? Planning. Planning? Yeah. Okay. Well, staffing levels are something that we, we, we continually uh, keep under review. We are, as I said, one of the smallest councils in, in the country. We're, all will be able to say how, exactly how many members of staff we've got, but it's something like 120, 150, which, which, which isn't many. The county council's got something like 15,000. So we're, we're not in the same, um, same group at all. 
Um, but in terms of delivering priorities and making sure we put the staff to the, uh, the, the priority areas and making sure our services work, that's something we're always trying to do. So, so that's certainly something that's at the forefront of our minds. Thank you. So thank you very much, Steve. Um, I'd like now to call upon Karen Emerickson, please, uh, to deliver the budget consultation. Thank you. I'm Karen Henriksen, the Council's um, Head of Resources, and I'm the Council's Chief Finance Officer. Um, so I've been asked to come to see you to tell you a little bit about the Council's budget proposals and Council tax um, for the financial year starting 1st of April 2020. Um, one of the biggest parts of our um, budget is the funding that we receive from the Government. Um, and you, I'm sure you're all aware of the austerity that we've faced in recent years. Um, and this first table shows the amount of um, grant that we receive from the government. They call it the Settlement Funding Assessment. Now, in the past, that had reduced dramatically. Um, but I'm pleased to say that in our um, allocation from the government for the next financial year, um, they've um, given us a 1.6% increase, so in line with inflation, effectively. And they call that the Settlement Funding Assessment. Uh, the spending power line um, indicates the amount the government think we can spend on our services, on our day-to-day -day services. Um, so that includes the amount of grant they give us, but it also includes what they think we can raise in council tax and what they think we can collect from business rates. Um, and I don't know if you can all see the figures, um, but that's increased from £8.7 million to £9 million pounds for next year. And that's an increase of 3.9%. But as I said, that includes the council tax that we collect. And if you dig deep into those figures, which I did, um, you can find out that the government are assuming that we will put up our council tax um, by the maximum of £5 per bandy, which equates to 2.39%. So <coughs> of the 3.9% increase, 2.39% um, comes from the council tax increase that we um, have to impose and you have to pay um, and not from the government. Um, this graph um, kind of shows you um, the trends on settlement funding assessments. So again, this is the government funding. So you can see there's quite, been quite a downturn since 2013-14. We used to get about £3.1 million pounds a year from the government and that dropped dramatically in the years of austerity. But I'm pleased to say that we're finally seeing a slight increase, as I said, we've got a 1.6% increase this year. So I'm hoping that that indicates an end to austerity and others start being more generous. Um, the, the settlement that they've given us for the coming year um, is just for one year, they've pointed out. In the past, they've given us settlements for three or four years, which helps our planning. Um, and I'll come on to that a bit more in a moment. So people ask me, where does all our money go? We pay the council tax, where does it all go? Um, this slide um, shows where that goes. Um, our spending plans um, are linked to our corporate priorities. So um, Steve mentioned the corporate plan, the consultation that I've been done. Um, we feed that then um, into our budget process. So, as Steve mentioned, there was extensive consultation over last year, and you've told us the services that were important, and then we tried to focus our spending on those. So you can see from this pie chart, probably as you'd expect, the biggest areas of spend are waste and recycling, which accounts for 23% of the spend, which is about £3.2 million a year, um, and clean and green, which accounts for 18% of our spend, about £2 million pounds a year. So those are the biggest services. The next pie chart shows how we finance our spending. Now you might think that we get a lot from government grants, but you can see, it, well, maybe at the back you can't, but this, this slide shows that we now only get 6% of our revenue funding from the government. If we did, when I did this exercise about 10 years ago, that figure was around 30%. So that's the bigger change we've seen. So the government are expecting uh, local residents and businesses 
to fund much more of the council spending and they're expecting us to become more, much more self-sufficient and not rely on government help. Uh, the biggest area of income is, is um, fees and charges and that accounts for 42% of our income and of that a big element um, is fees and charges from car parks <coughs> where we get about two and a half million pounds a year at the moment from our parking. So while residents might complain um, and ask us to consider free parking, it is a very big element of our funding and would cause a significant problem if we, if we were to reduce it significantly. The next pie chart shows our proposed capital spending. So capital spending is spending on assets, so spending on buildings, spending on vehicles and so on. And this is a five-year programme, and um, again, it's linked to our um, corporate plan priorities. The biggest element is for affordable housing, £5.4 million over the five-year period, um, and most of the funding for that um, comes from Section 106 agreements. Um, there's a large amount of expenditure on new vehicles for the waste contract that Ash mentioned in his presentation, um, £3.6 million pounds are due to be spent in 2021 um, for those. Right, so probably the bit you really want to know, our proposed council increase for 2020-21. Um, to fund all the services I've just mentioned um, and to deal with some of the cost pressures such as the increased cost of the new waste contract, uh, we are proposing um, an increase of £5 on a bandy property. At the moment, that's a proposal. It'll be subject to discussion, debate and approval at the council meeting on the 5th of March. Uh, an increase of £5 for a bandy property equates to about 2.39%. Um, if you live in a, a band A property, um, the £5 a year, uh, sorry, the yearly increase will be £3.34 which works out about six pence a week. If you live in the largest category, band H, the increase is £10 a year, and that works out about 19 pence a week. And we'll use the extra £5 um, per band D um, to fund the corporate pri priorities um, for our communities, uh, uh, such as climate change that we've mentioned, and also the extra cost of the new waste contract. So that's why we need it. Steve mentioned the financial uncertainties. So while we've got relative certainty now of, over the funding levels uh, for the coming financial year, uh, what the government haven't told us is what our funding levels are beyond that. And that makes financial planning very difficult. Um, I'll just run through quickly some of the main uncertainties. Uh, the first one, or the first four actually, are all linked to government funding. So the first one is the government's comprehensive spending review. Um, that's the exercise that the government carries out to decide how much it allocates to each of its own departments. So um, our government department is the Ministry for Housing, Culture and Local Government, but obviously that has to compete for funds against the NHS, the Ministry of Justice um, and all sorts of other government departments. So the first hurdle we've got to get is our MHCLG, as they call it, um, must get a reasonable chunk of total government funding. Uh, once that's decided, the MHCLG then have to decide how much it gives to each council. Um, and to do that, uh, they're carrying out something that they call the Fair Funding Review. So what they've said is they think the current method of distributing funds to each council um, isn't perhaps up to date, doesn't reflect um, the needs authorities have, doesn't reflect perhaps where there are deprived areas, where there are rural areas, um, things like dealing with social care. So they're basically um, going to carry out a full review of how they allocate the funding. The problem for us is that if you read the newspapers um, and the press releases and so on, um, all of the things about local government spending uh, the cost pressures in the government's mind are all to do with county council services. So they're talking about cost pressures of adult social care, cost pressures of children's care, 
cost pressures of education and they don't really um, reflect on the cost pressures for local authorities. So I'm concerned that when the government shake up all the funding arrangements, a bigger chunk will go to county councils and we might lose out. Uh, they're doing a similar thing with business rates. So you've probably read a lot about, for, especially in the election manifestos, where um, MPs and, uh, were saying uh, that the business rate system isn't fit for purpose. So not only are they saying it's not fit for purpose, but then again it's how they then share that out amongst local authorities. So that's another area where we might lose income that we currently get. Uh, new Homes Bonus is a specific government grant. Um, in 2020-21, the government have told us uh, we'll be getting £600,000 for that in, in that year. Uh, but they say after that, uh, they're withdrawing it. So that will be a big cost pressure that we've got to face. Uh, they're saying that they're putting the money that would have gone to that into the pot for the fair funding review. So whether we get that back in another route is uncertain. Um, we've got other cost pressures to face. Um, Ash mentioned about the waste contract, so not only have, have we got the increase in price that we know about um, and the extra costs of paying for the vehicles, but there are also some financial risks within the waste contract. Um, the, um, the previous contract, the current contract, um, assumed that all the costs of dealing with recycled material um, were borne by the waste contractor. Um, and nowadays, in the new contract, uh, that will be shared with us. So if the um, market for recycling materials um, gets any worse, then there'll be a financial cost to the council. Um, so that's an added cost pressure we'll have to deal with. Um, and the way we're dealing with that at present is to build up a reserve that we can dip into if we need to. Other uncertainties relate to things like the national minimum wage and the apprentices levy and also the National Pay Award, uh, which are negotiated uh, nationally or decreed by the government, and we have no say over those. So they're out of our control, but we have to deal with the consequences. And finally, inflation, the value of the pound, and Brexit at the end of this week. Who knows what's going to happen after that? The Bank of England had said inflation might go up to 5%. We remain to see. <coughs> Um, you might say, what's the value of the pound going to impact on Derbyshire Dales? Uh, we don't buy a lot from Europe, but it will impact on things like the price of vehicles, especially if there are trade agreements and tariffs put in, um, and those are all uncertain at the moment. What we've tried to do with all those uncertainties is to develop um, a medium-term financial plan to show our finances over the next um, five years and I don't know if you can all read this at the back um, but what we've done is we've forecast um, our spending over the next five years um, to reflect things like the corporate plan priorities and um, the extra cost of the waste contract but also some um, savings from the leisure contract which will grow over time um, so that's a benefit <coughs> that we know we're going to get um, we've then um, looked at the ways we've financed that forecast spending. Um, so we've predicted council tax income over the next few oh. years based on a £5 increase in the band D that we're recommending um, for 2021 and a 2% increase for the following years. We've also allowed for extra council tax coming from some of the new homes that we know will be built. Uh, we've allowed for inflationary increases in business rates income. We've been prudent there. Uh, we don't want to anticipate any new business rates uh, properties because we know the scope for that is limited. And we've built in the government grant funding which is dwindling. Um, and the bottom line of that is that we've balanced the budget uh, for the current year and for 2021, next year, after we've applied the council tax increase. Um, but after that, we've still got savings we've got to make. Uh, which come at the moment to around about £164,000. Um, at the moment, we're not planning to look for any more cuts in services to make up that £164,000 uh, because uh, we're concerned 
um, about the government funding and all the uncertainty around that. So we don't want to cut services now. If it does turn out that we get a better government funding for future years than we're anticipating. So given that it's a relatively low amount, £164,000, and we would have enough in reserves to cope for a year while we look to make savings, uh, we basically agreed uh, on an approach where we stand still until we know the outcome of those government reviews. We won't be looking for any further cuts in services until we know the outcome of those reviews. Um, our approach um, has been endorsed by a couple of independent reviews. Uh, we've had a review recently, um, a, a corporate peer challenge report by the local government association um, that commended our financial management. I don't know if you can all read it. It said, uh, through focus and prudent management, the council has a strong financial position which provides a foundation for the council's future ambition. And our external auditor, who was an independent appointment, said uh, we obtained sufficient assurance to conclude that the council continues to have appropriate arrangements in place. Um, despite that, the future is still unclear. Um, you know, is there any money there? Um, I'd really like to be able to have a good crystal ball um, and know what the future funding is because it's very difficult for us to plan our finances for the next few years when the government only tells us one year ahead what funding they'll give us. So finally, um, we will put this presentation on the council's website and councillors will meet, as I said, on the 5th of March to consider the proposed increase. Um, I am interested in your views, so I'd be pleased to hear your feedback now or on the feedback forms you've been given or you can email. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Karen. So I think it's a clear picture there that we're not out of <coughs> troubled waters yet. There's some tiny shoes of optimism. Uh, we councillors want to take the council forward and be positive for the benefit of the residents. But no different to your own home, if you go and spend beyond your budget, you're in trouble. So it's good to see we've got external auditors saying what our finance team is doing a good job. So questions? <laughs> Um, you know, the car parking is looks to be very significant. Uh, how much does come from the car parking here in Bakewell, the uh, up of this showground area? You know, um, I don't point? know offhand. We would have records to show would, that. Would it be very harmful for you to lose that revenue completely? Um, it probably would, because I would imagine that this is a large car park. Yeah. It's a yeah. significant amount of income. Okay, I was touched on earlier by a, a, another um, person in the audience, but there's a problem because uh, there's no 24-hour parking allowed, there's no overnight parking allowed according to the lease, and with you being in breach of the lease, that lease is at risk. Now, that doesn't just affect Bakewell, it's not a NIMBY thing, it affects the whole of the Derbyshire Downs because it'll knock a hole in your revenues that every ratepayer will, will have to cough up to match the, the loss. So uh, I'm sure it's going to come up later on, but you really do need to start doing something about the, the uh, unwanted guests you've got in the, in the showground. Yeah. Shall we get that tissue out of the way straight away? Yeah. We can only deal with the legislation pertinent to travellers. So as an authority, like all other authorities in the country, our only recourse is to go to a judge to ask for the judge to provide an eviction notice. Can I just take issue with that? Because at the moment, uh, you have no revenue from them ever. And you, could, you could actually do something about it. You could have people go to them and say, hey, it costs X to park here and collect it every day for every single vehicle. We can't do a massive difference. You can. We, no, we can't do that, sir. Uh, that, Tim, I'd like you to answer that because you're more knowledgeable than I am with regard to encampments and illegal encampments. <coughs> To use that. The situation regarding the microphone doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> um, the current situation regarding the travellers is we've been to court twice um, to seek what's called a possession order, which is, is the recourse to evict travellers in this case or anybody from land that the, county, that the district council owns. 
Um, the travellers have been represented at both those hearings and have presented evidence uh, in relation to very specific health needs on site which are immediate and short-lived. And the judge has seen that evidence and has considered it and has decided to defer the hearing on two occasions. On both occasions he deferred it for four weeks. We were last in court on the 16th of January and the next court hearing is I think the 13th of February. It's four weeks on to the 16th of January anyway. Um, and he will reconsider it then. His decision has been not to grant a possession order on the basis of the evidence presented to him. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of the health needs because I wouldn't talk about my health needs or Sandra's or yours, sir, in the public domain. But they are real and they do exist and a judge has considered them and come to a conclusion. Uh, and that's why we're in the situation where they're still on the car park here. We will be going back to, to court on the next date and we will be making our case again. It may be that those health needs have changed or resolved themselves and in that case we expect the judge to grant the order. You might lose the car park. That's, that I have no recourse, I can't evict them. We're under the judge's order. It's not within our gift. So the judge has made the decision. We're bound by judge's decision. That's the end of the story. Sorry, you could stop from getting there in the first place. But... With respect, we can't control the security end of this lane. That it, it would be impossible to control them. You haven't so, answered, sorry, you haven't answered the question. Said, sorry. Sorry. You haven't really answered the question regarding why you can't charge them, whether there's a judge's order, they're on a public car or a council car park. Whether it comes down to you can't do with them, but... It's to do with the leading encampments. Sorry, Tim, we need to come back in again, because you know more than I do. <coughs> car parking enforcement is not something under my remit, but I do deal with the guys who, who deal with that. Um, the situation is we've got an, an, what's called an unauthorised encampment, an illegal encampment in, in, the, um, in the car park. And our recourse is to treat it as illegal and to go to a, a judge, a county court judge, and seek possession. The, the thinking nationally is that by making parking charges, you're legitimising the encampment and that affects your ability to evict. So in general, councils don't use those, uh, the, the ability, don't use the pay and display charges to try and, try and deal with traveller issues. Um, but there's, you know, that, that's not a good, precise answer, but that's the reasoning behind it. And you said that there was... Um, you said that there was representation from the travellers at the, the hearing. What sort of representation is there from the, the Dales Council? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm talking as a local businessman. What sort of, who's, who's putting our needs across? Okay. Uh, the the, the, the travellers are represented by somebody from the Derbyshire Gypsy Liaison Group, uh, whose job is to represent traveller issues. The District Council is represented by a solicitor, has rights of address in, in the County Court, and if he requires uh, does happen to be here on this occasion. If he requires a, a, a witness to attend, that would be a member of the environmental health team, which is one of the teams that sits under my, uh, under my management. And do you have, I mean, do you take into consideration the local economy and, 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 and the effect of that? Is that, is that put forward in any hearing? Uh, but I have to say we don't contain, we don't include specific reference to the local economy in the general uh, address to the court. Normally speaking, we have no difficulty getting a possession order. As I say, the judge has taken into account very specific health needs, and I have discussed those with one or two um, residents who've asked me, particularly in the elected members of Baker know about those. I'm not going to go into them in detail in, in a public domain on film, um, but they are real. And, and a judge has decided that they are real enough and serious enough to warrant them staying here, given that those health needs are being met out of April as well. And I'll come to you in a moment. I just want to say one thing, if I may. Uh, I'm led to understand that there is uh, a bill going through Parliament soon to beef up uh, legal encampments and give more powers to police. So we're waiting for that legislation. So we are stymied with the legislation to our disposal at the moment. Mrs Chaplin, you've got a question. Yes, I'm Mary Chaplin. I live in White Bank Road. We're, I'm one of the only eight householders in Bakewell whose garden actually fronts the river. There are obviously other people who have a lot of trouble. I just, um, over, the, over the years, we work very closely with the council. The caravans that are, are there now are, bit, are the ones permitted by the judge. And they are members of the family who are giving health care to Mr. X, who is deemed to be unwell. During the last few weeks, I do really feel that the residents who live along the river, and I know some have walls and footpaths, have really been impressed by the amount of work that the council has put in 
and the way Mr. Braun and Councillor Purdy and our local councillors Wakeman and Sutton have put in tried to resolve this issue. I realise there is a lot of difficulty about it. I was a magistrate for 30 years, so I know how the court procedure works. But I do think that we should pay tribute to the amount of work that they're putting in to resolve this issue. And if the judge says that they have to move on on the 30th of February, I have been given every assurance by these people that they will seek an eviction order and that it will be done properly so that these people are named. So if they come back, they will be booted out. It is no good going to the police. The police are not interested. You have to have so many complaints before they will do anything. On Christmas Day, we have to put up with their noise, their generator goes. We have 340 metres of riverbank going round our garden. They, put, they go out and they prune trees. They chuck the white rubbish in the, in the river. It impedes the water flow right from the padlock bridge all the way down. But I must say that the council have at last understood that the residents want something done. So thanks to the council. Now you've heard what I've said, you've got to keep on doing the No pressure then. I, I really, I really did wish the government would bring that new piece of legislation out. Councillor Mrs. Judith Twigg. Yes, um, well, mine's a different thing. Bakewell is the only town in the Peak District National Park, and yet we're on the decline. At the moment, we've 17 empty shops. Now, it's probably, some of it is due to landlords um, that, the, uh, that charge excessive rent, it's due to the rates, but the worst thing of all is the car parking, because to get people to work here, they can't afford the expensive all-day car parking of the district. We're, we're hoping very, very much that the district will help them. At the moment, they, um, as has been said, they haven't received any rent from the car park that they lease off the Bakewell Horticulture and Agricultural Society. I'm hoping they don't lose the lease, but if they do, fair <coughs> enough, you'll, you'll have to find somewhere else. But we really need some, something in Bakewell to help, help the businesses and make Bakewell back a thriving town like it used to be. At the moment, it's in decline, and you've got to try and help Bakewell. Yes. opportunity to ask that question because Paul and I this morning have actually been to Buxton University campus to a seminar, a think tank led by Dr. Peter Dewhurst. Brian Taylor was present from the Peak Park and there were about 40, 50 other delegates Paul of high standing and the old uh, emphasis of that seminar think tank this morning was how to regenerate the towns in the Peak District. So this it's under central focus and hopefully something will come out of that. Yes, but if the parking is cheaper, perhaps some of the shops might be able to employ people to, to be able to park in town. Yeah. Councillor Mrs Twig, you, you realise what a big impact the car parking has on our general finances. Well, we're not getting it from Bakewell because it's all well, we well, we're not like to find where the car parking comes from. I know we're in Bakewell tonight, but you know this is the same. We've got problems in Ashbourne, Matlock. Even Basler, where I am, we've got empty shops. You know, this is a, it's a national problem. But we, it's something we're very keen on. You know, when the rates review comes, we don't know what's going to come from that. But it is something that, you know, we're all looking at. And everybody, all your ward members, everybody wants their towns and their villages to be successful. You probably, I'll, I'll, I'll come to you. I'm, I'm, I don't want to hog it, but there are some important points you need to get out. At that meeting this morning, there were representatives from Belper and Ashbourne. Now, I've been to Ashbourne to try and help them specifically, but you've probably heard the news that Belper's won a High Street Award. Yeah. 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 The answer when they interviewed the traders was because they're all working together to help each other. That's the message. Yeah. Questions, please. Gentlemen. Hey, yeah, my, name's, my name's Dan Harding. I, I am a resident. I may, I don't represent anybody else, but I think comfortably that I reflect my neighbours in, in um, where I live. Karen, I've got some good news for you. I have found your £164,000. I've got it for you. Yeah. So, I'm going to just quote, if I can, from the uh, flyer this evening, um, because there's a couple of really useful words in there. Um, we welcome scrutiny. 
scrutiny. Continue to review everything we do on a rolling basis. Review. <coughs> I'm sorry if I'm being a little bit antagonistic here. I am. Um, but I'm hoping to do it in a constructive way. <coughs> to ensure our services are cost effective. Again, important. Guaranteeing our residents get the best value for every penny of the 57p. Okay, we're talking about travellers. There are four travellers sites which are currently on the table. Rowsley is owned by the council. Somersal Herbert is owned by a gypsy traveller family, whatever name you choose to pick. I went to see them, they're all right. They own their own site. It's a windfall site. That's a good thing. The Woodyard at Cromford, valued in 2012 at £160,000. The secret size, it's a secret, but it's not a very well kept one. We think the value of that from the owner is around £250,000 to £300,000. Karen, there's your money. Uh, that's just the purchase price, never mind cleanup. Can you please? Here's the question. Can you please offer a justification? And can you tell us what your budget is using the taxpayers' money, pursuing the secret site in preference for the other sites, some of which already have planning permission, one of which is likely to have an appeal fairly shortly, one of which is already owned by the occupants. I've got two more questions. I can I can wait till we've had this one dealt with first, if that's okay. I don't think I don't think Cameron our finance officer can answer those questions, but I think I'm going to call on the chief executive, Mr. Wilson, to answer. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm more than happy to answer that question. Um, clearly, one of the reasons why we have a current traveller encampment in Bakewell is because, as a district, we do not have a permanent site for gypsies and travellers. We've never had such a site, and uh, it's long overdue that we identify a site. Um, the District Council did identify a site in 2013, and we went some considerable way to securing uh, that particular site until the landowner, which in this case was the County Council, had a changing stance, and that opportunity was taken away from us. So ever since 2013, as you have witnessed on many, many occasions in Bakewell, and residents in Doveridge, and Matlock Bath, and Matlock and Ashbourne have witnessed, we are dealing with many traveller encampments, primarily the same family, who are known to the District Council and frequent this, this area on a very regular basis. And that situation won't change until we find that permanent site. Now, the Council has made it a priority to identify a site. We are doing some work at the moment to identify a site. I'm aware there's lots of speculation, particularly in the Ashbourne media, as to where that site is. We've not confirmed any site, um, so that is news which the District Council have not verified in any sense whatsoever. And until such a site is identified and presented to our members for consideration, we won't be commenting on any of the options that we are looking at. But I can say that we have looked at many options. It is not one site that we are currently looking at. There are a number of opportunities which we are currently evaluating, and that will come back to our members in due course. Sorry, that, that, oh, that no, avoided... I'm to move on, sir. Sorry, go. No, excuse me. Sorry, you want two more questions? First of all... No, no, if, just if, bear with me. There are other people that have... Oh, yeah, I know, and I realise that this is awkward. Mm. I'm sorry for this. It's awkward for us. It's awkward for you. It's awkward for the people here who clearly aren't very keen on their new neighbours. The budget question. Is there a budget? Uh, you can answer that even if you can't answer the location. Yeah, I can answer the question. No, there is no budget set at the moment for the establishment of any site. Until that site has been considered by our members and we have detailed costings, then you wouldn't set a budget until that point. But there is no budget set at the moment. Okay, I, I would, in my business, I would anticipate that I'd want to have some rough idea of where my expenditure came from, but that's the answer, that's fine. Um, can I ask a similar vein? How much has been set spent? Um, you've been pursuing the, um, these 12, 14, 16 sites since 2012. How much has been spent during that period? And how much do you anticipate, bit the same, continuing that spend? 
also I'm very much aware that you have submitted those requests in writing and you will be receiving responses from the Council. I don't have that detailed information in front of me this evening, but you will be receiving responses. Thank you. Now, lady here, Captain Potter. As chair of Trinity Parish Council, I really, really do take exception to what Jonathan has said. How would you like, personally, anyone in this room to have to go and clear excrement up on the parking area? It's not a nice thing, and I think you want to be very careful before you start coming out things like that. There are two, we actually have had also toilets from caravans empty on the recreation ground. And there's children, there are footballers there. It's not acceptable, it's terrible. But there are two parish councillors from Rosie who have come specially to ask questions. And I think they're at the back, uh, in the foot there. In the foot. Um, yes, um, Victoria Friend from Rosie Parish Council. Now, um, my colleague and I came and spoke at the last planning meeting about the situation in Rosie with the travellers when planning was on the agenda, um, when the travellers were on the planning agenda at the meeting in November, and we were told that it would be back on the agenda at the meeting in February. Now, travellers are not on the agenda in February. In the meantime, Rosie has been designated a temporary uh, designated site for travellers, and they have been in Rosalie for a considerable amount of time. They are not there now, they're here. But if they are evicted from Bakewell in the middle of February, then Rosie will no doubt be a place where they will go back to. So I want to know A, why planning is, uh, why the travellers are not on the planning agenda for February when the position of Rosalie was explicitly stated to be readdressed with regards to what's happening with our site because we were promised in 2013 that we would have temporary permission for travellers for nine months and they would never be back again after that. They've been back, they've made a mess of our village and if they're evicted from Bakewell they will no doubt come back again. Travellers are not on the agenda in February so I would like to know what is going to happen with the designation for Rosalie. I'll be advised differently if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that because of the situation here now with the uh, terminal illness, the judge's ruling means that they are here. So therefore there's no need at present until we know the firm situation here, what plans we can make. So that's my understanding too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In relation to planning, it wasn't on the planning uh, agenda, it was on the agenda of the Community and Environment Committee. It's not a planning committee, it's one of the policy committees of the Council. Um, it was due to come back to the Community and Environment Committee in January, with the idea being that if heads of terms have been able to be negotiated for a, a, a permanent site, that that would be reported to the committee. It's very unlikely that heads of terms will have been negotiated for any site, as, as Paul mentioned earlier, um, by that time. Um, the travellers are here at the moment, uh, the council doesn't have anywhere to send them, doesn't have a permanent site to send them, it is possible they will go back to Rosalind uh, when they're evicted from here. Yeah, Steve Edwards from Bakewell Town Council. Some of the uh, questions I've got to ask tonight uh, have already been discussed, but the one that's on most people's minds is the information that's going around saying that the travellers were caught fly tipping and they were let off. Can you confirm or deny that? That's very, really interesting because obviously if you've got a court case going ahead with that, and it was true, then wouldn't that add to the strength of any court cases you go to to get them off the site? Would you like to just uh, answer that one? And also there is a piece of legislation in place at the moment, as Tim will obviously know about, under the um, Public Order Act, which says six or more vehicles, damage caused, loss, etc. The police can be involved. I don't know whether the current Chief Constable is saying that can't happen or he won't authorise it, but obviously I hope the Chief Executive and at least the Divisional Commander for this area are at least talking about it. Okay, in relation to the first bit, no, that's not true. Um, the simple answer to that question, um, we're aware that flight tipping has occurred. Um, there is no evidence indicating who the individual is who's un un undertaken that flight tipping. If we get that evidence, we will prosecute them. Um, the way that someone talked about flight tipping earlier when Ashford gave his presentation, 
Ash's team clear up fly tipping, my lot prosecute for it. Um, if we catch anybody fly tipping, we look to prosecute them. Um, they haven't been let off, that's not true. Um, in relation to the legislation that Bob Councillor Purdy referred to earlier is actually a consultation document on making trespass a criminal offence, uh, which is increasing the powers relating to, uh, to tra travellers or anybody else who trespasses on land. Um, there's a lot of debate about that. The Association of Chief Police Officers doesn't like the idea. Uh, a different element of the travellers' problems. They bring a lot of crime to us. Yet yeah, they bring crime. I've seen it myself firsthand. I've chased them out of Boots Chemist with the Boots uh, people, and there was no police there to stop them. They're stolen drugs to sell on. It, it is a problem. And you say that we need to be safe and feel safe in the Derbyshire Dales. Well, how can you feel safe if you've got travellers going in and out of shops and actually assaulting? One gentleman was assaulted, and that, that is factual. So really, could you do something about that, please? Well, we do try, Carol, I assure you. We've had conversations with the divisional commander. We've written to him. We've had conversations with local police officers. I had three incidents in Matlock Bath of more than a year ago. <clears throat> three separate reports of incidents, police refused to turn out. So the police is another issue which I can't answer. Uh, Mrs Walker, I'm very sorry that you had to witness that and that nothing was done about it, but the ward members will know and, and Tim will know, we have had reports of the travellers doing things and we've investigated them and it wasn't them that had actually done them. So there are, there, no that's true is it Tim, you know we've looked into it, they were supposed to be going to the swimming pool, having showers, and they weren't having showers, and various things. It's a really emotive subject, it's really difficult in all our area, we just have a legal responsibility. If you do have problems, please report them to the council, to your ward member, to, to the police. You know, thank you for what you've said about our, you know, environmental services team for clearing up. I mean. They do an absolutely sterling job working like that. Uh, so please continue to report any issues, but please bear with the council. We have to get this permanent signed. <coughs> Thank you very much. Paul Morris, I'm chair of the parish council of Stanton MP. Uh, I feel rather like a ping pong ball at the moment. Uh, and the ping pong ball is being batted backwards and forwards between Derbyshire Dales District Council. Uh, the uh, the Derbyshire County Council, the Environment Agency, and Entovens or Ecobats, depending on which you wish to, wish to call it. There doesn't seem to be any holistic approach to items that we need to talk about, such as planning, permitting, highways, health and safety, environmental, lighting, noise, etc. Uh, this ping pong has resulted in a gradual increase in the operation at Entovens. Each in increase is so small that it falls below the radar for many things like environmental impact assessments. And without a full, critical and transparent and fully scrutinised, something that's been mentioned earlier this evening, a, a fully scrutinised planning process to cover all angles that I've just mentioned, this situation will only get worse. The increase in HGV traffic, which I know is not part of your council consideration, but must be part of your planning consideration, must be partially to blame for the unfortunate death at Darley Bridge. An increase caused by the poor planning process not being holistic. What is planning to make these processes, what is planned, sorry, to make these processes more holistic? Please, no more ping pong. Thank you, sir. I haven't got an answer for that, quite frankly. There was so much in that that I was going to intend to talk to the gentleman at the end of the meeting. So, uh, I'm sure you've all, John Brockle has to go. I'm sure you've all heard quite a lot tonight about the travelling fraternity, and possibly the council are absolutely bored out of their minds when hearing about it, but not half as bored as the people who live around them are. And I'd just like to give a breakdown. I live very adjacent to the showground and things kick off 
between half past seven and eight o'clock every morning by a gentleman on my other side who has mental problems, I understand. He shouts and yells, and this is followed by radio, and this lasts probably half an hour or so. We have another session mid-morning, unless he's exercised by what I assume are two council carers who take him a walk, and when they do that, we miss out on the shouting and the yelling. Now, being a bricks and mortar resident, and in a, a G-rateable property, mm. it's not very enjoyable. Nobody wants whatever rate that they are, they don't want to live with this sort of thing going around. Feel sorry for we get to lunch time. You should feel sorry for the man. He's not a dog, yes. I think, I think, we, I think we're straying off. I, I, you know, so can, I, can I appeal to you, please, that, that there are some issues I've tried to explain tonight that are beyond our control. I appreciate this, but I'd like you to understand what we have to put up with on a daily basis. A dog starts barking at a very similar time in the morning and continues all day. And that is joined by two or three other dogs throughout the day. We get another session of the shouting and so on around about lunchtime, and then we're treated to a matinee performance in the afternoon. This includes radios and hall play. We just get a little bit tired of it. Thank you. I wish I'd got the answers for you. I haven't. We're in the judge's hands. We're in the legislative procedure of this government, all the previous governments, and we can't just magic these people, this solution, away. We're, you know, it's very frustrating, I understand. <coughs> Go to the lady at the back first, please. Is it on? My name's um, Julie Atkin, and I do represent myself, but I also represent the Walls Action Group, and I'd just like to follow up uh, with the, on what the gentleman from Stanton said. Um, about feeling a bit like a ping pong ball because um, I, I'm just I'm going to read my question. A lot of it's been covered by other people, but um, in May last year, the council voted unanimously to accept the climate emergency, which we all welcome. However, it was tragically brought into focus last November with the flooding. It's a fact that Matlock Town Centre has been flooded twice in a period of 14 months and both the lead local flood team and the environment agency have attributed the cause of that to flood it, that flooding to water runoff from the steep-sided valleys and from urbanisation. And yet it's still proposed that an additional 430 homes are to be built on the walls, with all that associated runoff water channelled into the already at-risk Bentley Brook. Matlock residences, uh, residents and businesses can't thrive and prosper with a constant threat of flooding hanging over them. And my question um, is, rather than merely prepare, prepare, preparing the proposed supplementary planning document, will you bring forward an urgent review of the local plan in order to safeguard residents, businesses and the future prosperity of Matlock? And if not now, have you got a date to do that? And um, the, the, the link with the, what the gentleman from Stanton said is we do feel that we've been caught between all those different agencies, not talking to each other about the, cons the consequences. And it is just a lack of, seems to be a lack of communication. That's how it seems um, to us. So I don't know whether you can answer that I'll call question. on the Chief Executive just to answer that for you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Clearly nobody um, should uh, be in any mistake about the significance of the floods that did affect the Darmstadt at the end of November. And the District Council uh, clearly played its part as part of that event and we're very mindful that the consequence of that is that there needs to be very careful consideration of um, why we did encounter the impacts that we did and what mitigation measures can we take moving forward in order to try and make sure that we don't encounter such significant events in the future. Uh, I think it's fair to say, and hopefully everybody would understand, that you know, the issue of climate change is very real. 
and the agencies are working together to try and understand why it was so significant as it was, not just in the Derbyshire Dales, but in Yorkshire, South Yorkshire in particular, who was affected just as badly. Now, uh, in terms of the, the issues locally, discussions have already taken place with the relevant agencies to try and understand exactly how the infrastructure did cope with that flood event, uh, whether it is at capacity or not, and what the impact of any future development may be on that existing infrastructure. Now, uh, the reference has been made to a very specific proposal at Walls Rise. Clearly, all of those issues will come to uh, be considered as part of that application. But as a, a much wider consideration around the issue of climate change and flooding, that will be taken forward as part of the local plan review, and that review will be starting uh, by the end of this year, because the review has to be completed by 2022. Thank you, Paul. Gentlemen, there, you've had your hand up for a long time. <coughs> Good evening, my name is Peter Dumenil. I am treasurer of a small charity called Tools for Self-Reliance. We have functioned in Bakewell for 35 years, up until April last year, when the premises we occupied in the basement of the Catholic Church were no longer available to us because the church decided to sell the building. So we had to get out. And we have been searching for an alternative premises since then. We have identified one or two buildings, principally the chapels of rest in Bakewell Cemetery, which don't seem to have any function anymore. And the other thing, which is of lesser interest, is the toilet just here. Um, what we do is we take in unwanted tools, usually donated to us by widows of lately deceased men with sheds. And <laughs> uh, what we do with these tools is we refurbish them, we put them back as good as new, as near as we can. And then we make them up into specific kits for specific trades which are then exported principally to East and West Africa to give people opportunities to improve their lifestyle. And so far we are trying to find an alternative premises. I am amazed at the great array of talent that we have here tonight. I thought we were only going to get three of you. Um, so if any of you can come up with an idea for a place, all we require is a source of electricity and preferably a toilet, but that's not important because there's plenty of alternatives around if we're central. And um, we will then set up our stall and go to work. And we're quite happy to pay for electricity. The one thing we cannot pay, which is a regret, is an economic rent for a premises, because there are a few here in Bakewell, but our total income in a year is less than 2,000 pounds. And there's no way we can pay economic rent. So if anybody can help us, we would like to go back into business doing what we did before. And um, we save money for a lot of people. And, um, we improve the life of others in third world. Thank you. It's commendable work you do, sir, and your team, and our officers have been writing furiously away, so the boss will acknowledge your request. Gentlemen here. Thank you. Howard Griffith, president of First Stanton Lees. This is about Endhoven and the so-called ping-ponging. This one's a direct question to the planning department which I put to them on the 17th of September. I waited for a response. I then sent another email in October. Eventually I got a response that the issue was under consideration. This is about Endhoven putting a white building in the middle of their huge plant. The drawings showed it to be matching everything else, battleship grey, blue roofs. It went out to consultation and the Peak Park, at a meeting of the Stanton Moore Liaison meeting, we discussed it and the Peak Park planning officers responded that they made no objection because the building on the plans was going to be exactly the same as everybody else. If I as a resident had put in a plan with colours and everything for my new building and then built it completely differently, you would be round very, very quickly telling me to either take it down or painted. This is just one of the many issues. I then waited for, well, in fact, to January, uh, waiting to hear about this investigation. I'd made a simple request that the building actually be painted Battleship Grey. Quite simple. 
and i'm still awaiting response this is a major concern to us because it seems to us that if we write specifically we give you all the detail i expect a response i used to work for the district council as you know paul <coughs> we had a deadline i thought to respond in so many days what is actually happening and when can i expect to get a reasonable response there are numerous issues that have been raised about i won't go into all of them but we're not even getting the courtesy of a response and neither are our parish councillors or our district council thank you thank you sir uh, Tim Bormer, sir. First, I'm very sorry you haven't had a response. I specifically asked for that to be provided, so I'm very disappointed not to set up. The answer to your question is the planning application is very clear. It applies for a white roof. If you look at the planning application form, it specifically says the roof will be white. If you look at the um, if you look at the form, Howard, it says the roof will be white, not the plan. If you look at the form on the website, then it's there in black and white. When why on earth was it actually approved? This is clearly and not well. Uh, all I can say to you is that the, the building has been built as it was applied for. Yeah. Keeping with the environment and the rest of the site. If you read the application form, which is on the web, it clearly says that the roof will be white. Then why did the officers approve it? Because it's clearly a travesty. It's been, it's been granted, it's been approved as applied for, and the application is on the website. Environmental concerns. Environmental concerns. Can I, can I ask that you email me personally and I will look into it for you. No, please, I will take it up personally and I will look into it for you. Gentlemen here. Thanks very much. My name's Mike Henley. I'm from Clifton down by Ashbourne and, and I can tell from the audience that, that not many people here have enjoyed having travellers on their doorstep. There are, however, a couple of points. There's, there's more than one family uh, involved in the traveller community. And like, like settled people, everybody's a bit different. And we've heard tonight from Councillor Birdie that we don't need to worry about this because there'll soon be a permanent site. The permanent site will be at the end of my garden, most likely. So your temporary problem will be my next 20, 30 years issue. So we need to think carefully about what the best thing to do with this is. There is, uh, there's that a quote by Einstein, I'm not sure I believe it, which is, the definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing repeatedly. We've been trying for about 10 years, longer than that, 15 years, to find a large permanent site for lots of travellers. Nine pitches in one site. That's very difficult, it's very expensive, it's a huge impact on many communities. For example, if it does go in Clifton, it's going to be maybe 40, 50 people in a village of 300. More than 10% of the village will suddenly be travellers. That will destabilise the place hugely. Yet, at the same time, you know, in a 2017 document from the planning office, I think it's planning office, either that or communities, it said we will accept greenfield sites to make up part of our provision. Currently, there's a site halfway between two villages no, there are no um, objections apart from one from the parish council, none from villagers. That's got six or seven pitches on it. They would only leave two or so to put somewhere else in the county. That is much, much, much easier, much less impactful than two sites. We've seen in Ashbourne already, the council is likely to face costs for a lost planning appeal. Do we want to do that again? We probably don't because we know how tight the budget is. Can I urge the council to consider not to stick to dogma, not to stick to what they've been doing for the last 10 to 15 years. There are other ways of achieving things, and we really need to have a rethink. Thank you very much. Okay. I do take issue with what you inferred I said, because I did not say that. So, gentlemen, the right. It's almost nine o'clock, so well, I hope we can get up on the evening with a decent question. <laughs> when I first spoke, it was really off the cuff because it was something to do with the thoughts of plan, and I didn't really think what I was saying. But tonight, I want to go back to what Paul Wilson says most of the time. 
all your objections will all go in, they'll all be carefully considered, and then the planning committee will look at everything very carefully, the officer will take their recommendations. But that takes about 20 minutes. We in the WAX group have been submitting written representations for something like six years now. In fact, in the meeting this evening, I really thought I was back in 2016 when there was such a lot of fuss made when you actually took our, our bald dry site out of the local plan. And I, I thought it was so nice to be among so many people objecting. But what I want to say is, um, is there no way in which the council can get together with us and see our evidence? I know that it means that you may be thinking this is going to predetermine the application, but when there is so much evidence available, um, I mean, I remember the old days, Mr Purdy, when you were just sitting on the, in 2016, sitting as a member, I think Mr Rose dealt with all the evidence that was given as anecdotal. He said he wanted evidence. Well, we've got that evidence, but I cannot see any way in which they can get, we can get that to the council in such a way that they can understand it even. That's all I've got to say, thank you. Thank you very much. I'll do me up to sir. Mark. As one of the local district councillors from April, um, it's for us if possible. Do we got a time scale for when the payback people will be able to start up? The co community payback scheme. Yeah, community payback, yeah. Thank you, Councillor Wakeman. Um, there will be a paper being presented to members outlining the scheme. Uh, as, as I explained to you before, I'd rather do a district-wide scheme uh, and allow members to contribute that, uh, to that from, from across the district, not just focused on Maple, but I'm hoping that that report will be going into Community Environment Committee in April this year. Um, then the next one is, um, obviously, as local councillors for Maple, we are doing a little bit every last Saturday and Sunday of the month. So if anybody in here wants to give us a hand, <laughs> please. Good, good plug, Mark. Uh, and the other that. one is um, Matlock Street. We've had a big, big influx of dog dirt, um, and it's not being cleaned up. Um, the shopkeepers are having to come out and wash it down. Um, I've had a few emails on that. Uh, no, I, to be honest, I'm glad you've raised this because um, dog fouling is is a bit of an issue, and I, I'm aware of that. And we, what we do when we get a report, we monitor how many reports are coming in and where they're coming in from. We, we have what we refer to as hotspot areas, so we try and get um, staff to patrol as well as regular cleans there. Bef before I scoff down and say this, just bear with me. Um, I looked at the number of complaints that we've had or requests for service in terms of dog farming for Bakewell before we came here tonight, and in the last 12 months there's been two, just two. Now, clearly the issue is much bigger than that, so what I'm asking um, is that people actually report it. We want people to report this because what that helps us do is performance manage the service, so the more reports that come in with the greater detail, our teams can then look at the trends and we can allocate resources accordingly. When they're coming in or we're hearing about it second, third, fourth hand, it makes it very difficult for us to then allocate those resources. And I'd say two reports in 12 months, everybody in this room knows, even if they don't know the errors that we're referring to, knows that there's more than that. So I would urge people to come forward, tell us, because it helps us manage the service better. If you report on CCTV, we send them a crime for that. You need a witness statement, Mark. Mark, you need a witness statement or a photograph presented to the police. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to take one last question. It is nine o'clock. Gentlemen here, you've had young dog many times, sir. Are there any plans to improve the messy area on the showground which visitors to Bakewell were invited to park on? The uh, plastic grid doesn't stop the soil coming up and making mud. Parts of it are covered with limestone with deep puddles and so on. It's not a good welcome to Bakewell. It's a subject I've raised at previous forum meetings, saying that 
uh, redoing the plastic grid is throwing good money after bad when there are much better solutions to getting grass growing on a hard surface. Pause indicating the answer for you. Yes, uh, there are resources allocated in our capital programme to, to look at that. Um, one of the particular problems we have with that area is clearly it has a high intensity of use and the real solution that we need to look at is how we can best rotate the parking around the site in order that some land can rest, uh, in order that it, it can recover. Um, but clearly, given the demand that are placed on this complex generally, both at the livestock market and town centre trading, and that's something that we, we need to clearly have regard to as well. But yes, there are funds identified for those funds. Well, look, once again, thank you very much. Two quick questions, nothing to do with travel. Thank you, appreciate that. environmental questions. Well, well done. Uh, when are the locks going off the bridge? Yeah. When, when are we getting rid of the logs, locks? And can we have a bylaw or something that uh, prevents people from selling takeaway food with any of parts of plastic at all. Yeah. If you go to the seaside, I've got a Whitley, everything there, it's a wooden fork, you get to, to the cardboard carton, there's, there's no plastic anywhere. Um, they're called Snyder with it. I mean, if you've got these horrible little plastic forks, and everything, you know, you get a lot. Those new bins are very, very good, but not everything ends up in them. Okay, the point's been picked up by board members and the county council, I'm sure that will be looked into. So, Ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much for attending. We knew when we came here we were not going to provide you with all the answers. It's totally impossible. I hope that we have helped you uh, illuminate the position the council's in, uh, the fact that we do get some good reports back of how we're performing. Um, if you've got any issues, like I've said to these two gentlemen, maybe here, please come and see me now. I will pick it up. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much for attending and have a safe journey. Thank you.